talking this about this conference the, will now be recorded. Uh, <laughs> so we will be talking about uh, how we're uh, asset managing uh, materials by rail. So just to give a sort of brief introduction, uh, I've been on the railway for about 22 years, and um, I've worked predominantly for the last 10 years in asset management on the what's now called the North Western Central Route, or LNW, as we all used to know it. Uh, Basolda has been on the railway about five years and has, has spent probably that, that length of time in, in asset management as well. So without further ado, um, the topic, sorry, okay. uh, so the topics we're going to cover today, we'll, we'll do a safety moment. It's something that Network Rail and a few other companies do like to do before the start of a meeting. It just sort of helps uh, give a bit of focus to people. Uh, then we'll go into what materials by rail is, um, how we've uh, attempted to asset manage uh, uh, that aspect, uh, and what operational and infrastructure impacts we've had from, from the, uh, this, these services that start to run. Uh, we'll introduce a risk assessment process, uh, um, which is known as TARA. I will sort of give you an update on um, where we are with things and what lessons we've learned. So the main thing to remember with this is that uh, We've actually, this is the second time we've actually given this presentation. So if you uh, were in January uh, on the Manchester Liverpool section, uh, we gave the presentation then, so it's been slightly updated since then. Um, but this is reflected around uh, work that was undertaken in 2019. So safety moment. Um, about this time last year, uh, Basel and I were, were, were asked to go out on a, a site visit with the Manchester East TNE, um, and we went to uh, Dinting. We, we were there to inspect uh, the s and that's either the side of Dinting Viaduct, um, but as we were passing over, uh, we noticed that there were these inspection hatches. And if you can see on the, the photograph there, there doesn't appear to be any padlock or anything of that nature. And, and these are fairly regular, so every, every 20 metres across the viaduct. Uh, so out of curiosity, we lifted the hatch uh, and were rather shocked to find that um, it was pretty much a clear drop straight through uh, the, the substructure uh, down to the ground below. And if you're not familiar with the viaduct, uh, there's a, a shot of it from Google Maps, and you can see it's probably about 100 foot up. So naturally, we uh, we close called that, uh, and that's gone through to the to the structure ram team, and uh, and there's been action since then. So it's, not, it's, uh, it's always quite an interesting thing that you know that you encounter these things still on the infrastructure. Uh, the risks to people and of course the, the risks to the public because the station at Denton is just off the end of the viaduct so probably from where the photograph the initial picture was taken probably only about 60, 60 70 meters away so in regards to materials by rail then so so what is materials by rail well, well materials by rail is the name that's been given to the freight services that HS2 are going to start or have started running around the network um, basically what 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 they are is that the, when, when they construct phase one, uh, HS2 needs to move some aggregates uh, to, to help with that construction and obviously also to remove spoiler as well uh, around the, and uh, this is traveling around the infrastructure. Why are we concerned about it? Well, we've had past experience of where freight services have suddenly started appearing. Um, the one which I think probably quite a few people might be familiar with is the DRAC services, which I'll, I'll touch upon in the next slide. So what initially drove us to, to, to start worrying about and risk assessing uh, this stuff? So initially, uh, we started looking at what settlement risks there were uh, with regards to the tunneling in the Euston area. So for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, so HS2 is running from Euston Station uh, and heading north. So in the station area of Euston, they're actually building a, a, a huge station, which is slightly lower than our infrastructure. Uh, and that the main lines will be then tunneled under uh, our existing infrastructure uh, on its way north. So the settlement risk, um, the initial assessments from last year were showing that potentially we could be having about 200 mil of settlement. So naturally from a, from a P-way point of view, uh, from the plane line and particularly the SNC, that was, that was a great concern to us. So we started looking at ways of risk assessing this and determining where, where our main risks were in terms of SNC particularly. Uh, and what mitigations the, the contractor could do um, uh, to, to facilitate this uh, down in that area. But from that, we also then learned that uh, with, the, with the removal of platform 17 out of normal service, uh, platform 18 being removed completely uh, at Euston Station, uh, the freight services for uh, spoiler and aggregate would then be travelling down into the Euston's road and down to platform 17. 
now historically Houston stations never really seen uh, any freight services at all so obviously again that started raising uh, alarm bells and, and sort of thinking about what impact that might have So how does this all tie into asset management? Well, we won't touch upon this. So obviously, uh, if we know what risks there are that are approaching, then we need to make sure that whatever plans we have in place um, will actually be uh, the, the correct ones in terms of uh, mitigating risks. So just to drop onto the case study that I mentioned there, the DRAC service. So DRAX was, uh, is, the, is the service that runs between Liverpool and Hull, uh, and it moves the biomass materials for the power stations. Um, about five years ago, uh, the region was approached uh, and told about these services starting and initially it was said oh it'll be about two or three services a day something like that the reality is it actually ended up in many cases uh, about two or three an hour so we got a huge increase in tonnage running on the network and the service was running uh, so from the Liverpool docks it would drop onto the west coast and then come off at Hartford Junction and then along the, the Chester line the Aldrington line uh, into Stockport and then off towards the east uh, the upshot of that was that the Altrincham line uh, suffered really badly with, with uh, degradation, so that the, the rates of wear rapidly increased. Um, and within within a short period of time, we ended up having to put a lot of speed restrictions on there, uh, and the delay minutes towards the northern services in particular were racking up. And then it got to the point where, irrespective of any other influence, uh, the northern services into, into Piccadilly across that route were delayed by 10 minutes, they'd say, irrespective of anything else. So as, a, as an asset management outfit, we, we then set about making repairs, uh, doing renewals, uh, many refurbs, that kind of uh, work. And we spent in order, something around about four million pounds to, to actually get the track back into a state that it, it needed to be in to, 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 cope, to cope with this, this additional freight and all the other services. Um, and that work is some of that work is still actually undertaken, but it as another illustration of how freight services when they get, when they suddenly appear on a network or somewhere where it's not normally expected. Uh, during the COVID crisis, the first lockdown, um, because of the reduction in the passenger timetable, the biomass trains were actually diverted through Piccadilly. Uh, basically, that, uh, that 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 was done from an operational point of view because it took apparently about an hour or so off the journey time that these things take. Um, however, uh, Piccadilly is, is, is it, it's an old asset to a certain extent, but it has never really suffered from a broken rail, certainly not in recent years. Uh, and within the first week of the biomass travelling in that direct, uh, through that, that area, uh, we experienced, uh, I think it was three broken rails. So it sort of gives you an idea of, of how much freight can really impact on the infrastructure. So the lessons learned from that were that um, basically, yeah, we needed to be well aware of these things happening to give ourselves enough time to, to to mitigate off the risks. So in terms of asset management, um, you probably may or may be familiar with this, this diagram here. So this is an asset, asset management life cycle chart. Um, and what you can see from the start there is, is this, well, basically there's lots of influences coming in. So one of the main ones that we tend to get is obviously influences from the, the services that run, so that's the train operators, the freight operators. Uh, we can get influences from projects, that kind of thing. We also have internal um, uh, organisations that, that influence uh, what we need to do. And one of those is what's called the TCRAG process, which is Timetable Change Risk Assessment Group. And that's something I will touch upon next. Uh, as part of running anything really you need to know how it's operating and how it's maintained because that then gives you an idea of what actually how you're actually going to manage that asset uh, and as part of that we always we're constantly reviewing uh, and, and taking a view on risks um, that the assets are seeing uh, and being subject to and that then all feeds the way back around into where our work banks are um, so hopefully then we can set up a, a five-year work bank which will offset anything that we're aware of the, of the changes to the infrastructure and the needs of the infrastructure to, and up to the moment we've we'll put very much a push on uh, making sure that we supply what needs to be done for for our customers so the freight operators train operators and the paying public so the TCRAG process um, so the TCRAG process was a, a, a regional based 
uh, team that used to sit uh, and review any timetable changes. So as we're probably all familiar with, there's a timetable change every May and every December of the year. The process itself uh, would look at the future, the, the, the next timetable along. So for example, in, uh, in, in, in 2019, the December 19 timetable was assessed in April 19. So there's about 32 weeks between the changes. Um, within that process, uh, what happens is the, 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 the freight operators and the train operators, they bid for paths within the timetable as they see it. So they basically say, you know, we want to start running services X, Y, and Z. What happens then is there's a review undertaken, which uh, is typically uh, around about 14 weeks that Network Rail has, has a chance to review this process. Um, and then we'll, Network Rail will then make an offer back uh, for which services we say, yes, we're okay with that. Um, anything that's a sort of small change. So typically if you get sort of a freight, or, uh, sorry, no, freight um, a train operator wanting to make a small change. So for example, uh, again, on the old freedom line, uh, Northern have said uh, that uh, certainly last year, I'm not sure if it's running yet actually, but uh, they said that they wanted to increase their service on a Sunday. So currently it was like a two hourly, uh, every two hours sort of service, and they wanted to change that to an hourly service. But generally, I mean, that's light units, uh, you know, uh, diesel units. So, so really, that's, that there's not a massive change in terms there. So for that sort of change, it's pretty much business as usual. When it comes to something like freight uh, coming along, um, obviously we're talking slightly different tonnages um, and with the materials by rail, they actually requested in April uh, something like 270 paths, so 270 extra services were being requested to, to, to facilitate this movement of, of materials. Um, so what, what does the TCRAG process do as well? So what the TCRAG process does is it allows us to, to look at what the frequency of the train services are, what those patterns are, so where they're running, what ELRs, uh, engineering line references that they affect, and what type of train is it, so what's the consist. Um, so in terms of the materials by rail, they were top and tailed class 66, as you can see in the photograph, um, which isn't actually a materials by rail train, that's just an example, uh, and was going to consist of uh, typically around about 20 uh, JNA, uh, wagons. So once we knew what material, what, what the vehicle was, we knew what uh, what loads were going to be used, uh, we, we were then able to start looking at for what impact that's going to be. Uh, so typically a training weight for a, for a freight train could be anything up to about 2,400 tonnes. Just as a point of note, uh, the TCRAD process has actually changed. So, in, so 2019 was, was in theory the last time that that exact process was used. So in 2020, we, we, we now have it called the train plan risk assessment. And it's, uh, it's, it's still very much a similar process because it's, it still uses the same uh, standard document. Um, however, in terms of the meetings and the discussions, they're a little bit more tailored to actually give pertinent information to the routes so we can make a better judgment on what those risks are. Back in the day uh, with the TCAD process, it was a very long drawn, a full day meeting uh, and sometimes it was it was easy to miss the, the pertinent information that you wanted. Uh, these meetings now are, are about two or three hours uh, and they're a lot better. However, they're still not perfect for freight. Uh, for train operating um, uh, passenger services, it's really good. We, we can really capture those, but freight is still a little bit uh, iffy. And that's generally because they can also use what's called short-term planning. So at any given day or about three days out, freight operator can actually request a path uh, which wouldn't then come through to say the likes of the asset management team. So as you can see it's quite a bit of a headache to, to actually keep on top of this and typically um, when it comes to track, categor uh, track categories and track tonnage uh, as a route asset management we, we've always relied on ACTRAF so what's actually run in the past 12 months which is an upshot means that um, our tonnage values and our track category values are always at least 12 months out of date. And that's something that we're currently in the process of trying to, to overcome um, and actually be a little bit more predictive. So we're, we're, more, we're more up to speed and not, not playing catch up all the time from a maintenance point of view or a remittance point of view. So the routes of the MBR, so like I say, they, they bidded for 270 extra paths. Uh, by the end of August of 
2019, uh, Network Rail had actually offered back 86 services. So that sounds like a massive reduction, but we're still talking quite a, quite a number of services being introduced onto the network. Um, as a result, uh, there was 23 ELRs that were affected. Uh, so, so an ELR, for anybody who's not familiar with that, it's uh, basically an ELR uh, is, is a section of route, a section of track that runs from typically one junction to another junction, and it will have a name, uh, which it might be, say, the BBB, which is Bolton to Blackburn, uh, and that's what the, the ELR is. So there was 23 of them, which you might think out of the 323 that I think it is that we have across our region, it's, it's only about seven percent, but it's a lot of those ELRs are sort of long, long sections um, uh, and, and predominantly on the, the West Coast main line. So the service was running well. They were predominantly coming for for aggregates. Uh, they were predominantly coming out of the Peak Forest area, so around Buxton, uh, and, and heading off either south towards Crewe or across to, across east towards Door. The problem we had when we first uh, looked at this. Uh, in terms of the pathing and uh, the, the volume, was we didn't actually know exactly which route they're going to take, and it's and we still don't fully know which one they're going to pick. So we've had to base a lot of our work on assumptions uh, and, and sort of guesstimates, really, to some extent as to where we think the risk might actually lie. So just to give another idea. Um, so here on this map, uh, hopefully you can see that uh, quite clearly. Um, the coloured lines are sort of the, the indication of where these services could end up trundling around. Uh, and we have there is the, the hind low, so the Buxton area where the aggregates are all coming from. And on this diagram, we've got we're showing the spoil coming out of Houston and uh, the, the weef off the Wembley area. Uh, so the spoil coming out of here is, is is mainly to do with the tunneling that's going on for, for the, uh, the new lines. Uh, the reason why this broken down into northwest, central, and southern is there's, there's different contractors. So these are all different contractors uh, using different routes. So again, this this is the central one. So this is similar with Hindlow, but this time we've also got Calvert and Banbury uh, involved in the mix. And on this one, West Coast South, so there's Euston again and Wembley. Uh, and then this time, this one also brings in the area of West Ryslip. So this is this area is predominantly a lot to do with tunneling. So I've touched upon what, uh, what what we sort of look at in terms of uh, we need to know what effects with tonnage are. So the way we do that is we look at track categories. So anyone who's familiar with uh, 2102, our design and construction standard, uh, will, will be familiar with this graph. So this basically shows what track categories uh, are in relation to speed. And it, it's actually equivalent tonnage, not equated. So the standard actually names it <laughs> very slightly wrong. Um, and what this does is it, it, it allows us to determine, uh, basically from the track category, we, we know what the construction should be, so what the materials should be, and also, more uh, importantly, uh, what the maintenance regimes are. So each each category has a set amount of maintenance activities that need to be undertaken in certain timescales. The biggest jump that we, we experience in, in terms of these regimes uh, is actually from CAT3, which the three is slightly off there. Um, into CAT2, uh, and that's where we get a real significant uh, step up in the amount of maintenance. The the direction, if you like, of, of the category, so so five and six are typically uh, little used backwater lines, so uh, CAT6 is, it would be a typical siding as well, and CAT1A is, is obviously is your, is your high speed uh, uh, sort of main line, so, so West Coast main line, some sort of places become CAT1, CAT1, CAT1A. Um, so in terms of working them out, so there is a method, so in 002 uh, uh, standard there is a, uh, a process you can follow to, to actually work out what the equivalent tonnage is, and this is calculated based on uh, obviously the weight of the vehicle and the weight of the, the, your, the training weight is that's being pulled, uh, and then it's multiplied up by uh, a, a couple of coefficients. So to try and make that a little bit easier to understand, if I take a class 66 loco, just the loco in itself, we know that it weighs 129.6 tons uh, and has a, a typically an axle weight uh, of 21.6. We know from data specifications of the vehicle that it has a, a power to rail of 2.24 megawatts. Uh, and if we assume it's running at 60 mile an hour from that 002 standard, we then get these two coefficients for power and for speed to be uh, multiplied to the weight of the vehicle. 
So once you've done that, you can see that the, the a class 66 on its own becomes 279.9 tonnes. So, so it gives you an idea of how this equivalent tonnage actually works. And it, it puts on probably something like 80% uh, additional tonnage on. And what that's doing is that's that's then trying to take into account the, uh, the degradation that that tonnage will cause to the, to the rail and to the infrastructure in general. Um, and I think it's also partly used uh, in terms of track access charges as well. So that's why uh, you know, freight will generally be paying more, more track access charges than, than passenger. So once you've gone through and you've calculated for all the paths that we've got, we know what's running, uh, we know where it's running, we can then start looking at those track categories in relation to you know, those engineering line references that I mentioned. And these three little tables sort of give you a, a, an overview as to what changes to, to the tonnages uh, we were likely to be experiencing. And you can see here that uh, there's two ELRs particularly uh, have got some significant increases. So the BUX and the CNB4, they're actually two uh, single line sections in the Peak Forest area. Um, so you can see that there are some, some significant changes and obviously significant risk uh, coming into the network. With the track category information, we were also then able to share that with other disciplines, particularly structures and earthworks. Uh, and as a result, actually, um, there's one structure on the on the SNJ uh, branch, which is the Middlewich branch near uh, between Northwich and Sandbach. Um, and there was a, there's a long timber bridge on there that was that was earmarked for reconstruction in CP7 with the structures team. Uh, as a result of understanding how these tonnages were potentially going to be changing and the risks associated with it. Uh, that was actually accelerated, and I think it's actually this month that it gets replaced. Um, so that, that's one of the changes that we've we, we, we've witnessed, certainly from knowing this information. Again, I've touched upon there that uh, obviously the, from track catchery we, we get the changes to the maintenance regime and potentially impact on on access, etc. But uh, I think Priscilla always going to touch upon that a bit more uh, later on. So we so with this increased tonnage, we're going to see. Uh, an, an increased rate of deterioration. Um, so in order to deal with that, we, we we took what we'd started in Houston and we applied that across the network. So, and this is what the entire process is. So I'm now gonna hand over to Basola and she will talk you through that process. Over there, Basola. Hello. Hi. Hi. I was talking to myself there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you can tap So over to you then. Thank you. So the track asset risk assessment and why was it created? Um, so in Network Rail, we have an internal DSD tool which is called the, the, the decision support tool. I always stumble there. And it assigns risk numbers to plane line eights, but those risk numbers don't apply to the SNC within those eights. Therefore, we needed to create a way, a numerical way of assessing SNC in a similar way to the way plane line, plane line has been assessed. So the TARA process was developed to assess um, our current infrastructure that's going to be affected by the proposed MBR freight services. So what have we used the TARA to do? We've used the TARA to identify current critical risk, current critical areas and sites. We've used it to identify key risk assets by understanding the impact of these additional services and then use all that information to create a mitigation work bank to strengthen the assets and mitigate against future failures. So the TARA itself was created by getting information from a range of different data data sources within Network Rail. The first one being LADS, so that's our linear asset decision support tool. And we use that for collecting asset information, sort of basic asset information. The next one is the DSD that I mentioned earlier, and that was used for collecting asset population and then some more detailed asset information. The next one is um, RDMS, which is our defect management system, and that was used to collect um, RCF data, defects, and cyber information. And finally, um, the CCQ charts, which we use to collect track quality data. So as you can see, we had to feed in information from quite a few different sources to populate the TARA. So from all these data sources, um, these, are, these are the key criteria that were collected for each individual SNC and plane line eight. And all of these criteria were then given numerical weightings. So just to talk through a couple of them, 
for example, earthworks. So earthworks condition was factored into the TARA process from the earthworks um, geotex RAMS risk assessed database. Um, high derailment risk, so 053 risk, was also factored into the TARA process. And these refer to SNC points that have been that have been currently assessed as being having a high risk of derailment and as such require higher levels of inspection. And finally, golden assets. Um, so these refer to assets that uh, have, a, have a high operational risk. So in case, in the event that, that, that they fail, they cause significant delays across the network. So for example, um, a set of points at Houston Throat, if that should fail, would knock out about four different platforms. That was something that would consider a golden asset. So that was also factored into the TAR process. So all of this data was collected for a two year period and it was limited to two years just to keep asset, the data volumes manageable while still having a good length of time to assess the trends and behaviors over. And then each individual criteria was assigned a weighting ranging from zero to five. So zero being the lowest rating or weighting a, a, a criteria could get and five being the highest or, or the worst. So in the next slide, um, I just show a few of the criteria I mentioned in the previous slide and how the weightings have been assigned to the criteria. So for example, in track quality, um, super red being the worst track quality was weighted um, a five and good track quality weighted a zero. For RCF, um, very severe RCF again being the worst RCF condition was weighted a five, um, ground clear or no RCF weighted a zero. Similarly with earthworks, similar idea again, where low risk earthworks were weighted ones and high risk were rated fives. Um, across the board where we had no data or something wasn't available, we weighted everything, weighted those threes, just because we don't know if the data will be better or worse, but it still allowed us to factor that into the TARA process. So the next slide is just, uh, a truncated version of the Tara spreadsheet. Again, it's quite a very long sheet, so this is just a, a small snapshot of, of, the, of the process. So the first bit just gives you general information about the SNC points, where they are, who maintains them, their mileage, um, speed, that sort of thing. The second bit shows um, the waves of which, which is work done and defect information. So for each individual SNC assets and plain line assets, um, all the defects for two year period and all the waves of work done for two year period were all summed together to give the final numbers on the screen there. So that's for a two year period of defects and waves. Um, the next bit is tonnages. So um, MBR tonnage, which Dave mentioned earlier how it calculated that is what's in the, on the screen there. And next to that is a predicted EMTA, which is a, com a combination of the MBR tonnage and the 2019 ACTRAF data. So that tells us what the track going forward will be, the tonnage on the track going forward. Um, the la next bit I think is current risk score. Yes, current risk score. So that current risk score shows us the summation of the weightings for all those different criteria across for each asset. And to get the predicted risk score right next to it, um, a tonnage factor was calculated based on the current and predicted tonnages. And that multiplier was then applied to the current risk score to give a predicted score for the asset based on additional tonnage. And a threshold of 100 for, for, for the predicted risk score was picked because so, so that then any assets that scored 100 or greater were then looked at further and then used to become our initial work bank. And 100 was picked because for an asset to score over 100, it showed either a high number of defects, a high number of waves, or that it will be significantly impacted by the increase in tonnages from the MBR traffic. So once we got our initial work bank together at this point, we started liaising um, with the maintenance engineers to get on the ground information of the assets. So through this discussion with, with maintenance, there are some SNCs, points, and even plain line assets that we scored under 100 or that was scored by the tile process under 100 through system data, but actually the TME let us know that they actually have issues with them on ground. And then we were then able to then correctly prioritize those assets and push them into our work bank on their recommendation. And I guess so far, as you can see, the TAR process is quite a very data heavy process. So it's only as accurate as what we put into it or what's available to put into it. So that 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 liaison and, com and conversation with TMEs and maintenance teams is, was, was very invaluable to validating that work. 
So once we've talked to maintenance now, we've got a work bank sort of started off and then we can now categorize and prioritize our work bank. And that's what the priority column there is showing. So we have three different categories for our work banks. Um, one being red, so we had red, ambers and grays. So red category assets were those that we would require some remedial or renewal work before the MBR train start running. And so those are the assets that we thought were or was assessed to be the most likely to fail in the nearest term. Um, amber assets were those that will degrade eventually or inevitably. So the works that we need to do to them can be done while the trains are running or can be reprogrammed into the work bank. And gray assets are sort of residual risk that we can live with as as a management team. So they're not essential, but the track can then be um, attended to only in the event of failure. And then we use that information to then create work packages based on the reds and the ambers and then funding based on that. So then the kind of work that was assigned to each of these was, um, sorry, the kind of work that was assigned was um, based on discussion with TME, so either renewal or refurbishment for, for, for SNC. So um, the next slide now um, was some hotspot areas that we identified throughout the Northwest. So the first bit is Peak Forest and Chinle area. So these featured quite heavily in our proposed work banks. Um, as Dave mentioned earlier, the, the BUX and CMB4 are single line tracks, um, and they will be experiencing significant um, tonnage, tonnage increases from, from, from freights. And these are all red based red assets, red category assets in our work bank. And I've got a picture, I think. Yes. So this just gives you an idea of sort of the current condition of the track in the Peak Forest and Shinley area. As you can see, it's quite it's chock full of wet beds and we're going to send even more traffic down this path. So as you can see, it's quite a hotspot area for us. Um, the next bit is the MAS and Earl siding. So we assessed this route and then the, but the risk was eventually deemed low only because it's less likely that the trains are going to, the MBR trains are going to take this path to go down south. Um, third is Stockport. So the Stockport area has work proposed at Edgy number one and Keith Norris Junction. This is um, this is a high, this is a hotspot area for us because it's a highly used route on the West Coast Main Line for passenger services. So introducing these freights, these new MBR freight services, will only introduce more operational risk for us, and that makes it a hotspot for us. Um, the next, I think, is SNJ. So that's the Middle Ridge branch, and then the Crew Basswood Independent Lines. So the Basswood Independent Lines will be experiencing again significant um, tonnage increases from the MBR. But in addition to that, there's the Crew Hub projects that will be diverting services um, onto the Independent Lines during construction works. So that that, that little bit of track is going to be seeing additional tonnage from MBR traffic freight services and in, and additional um, passenger diversionary routes from crew station. So that's just going to put more pressure on an already failing assets. And again, a, a picture to show you sort of the condition of the track there currently. And we're going to put even more tonnage on that. But as you can imagine, that's quite a high risk area for us. So in the next slide just gives you a quick snapshot of the results from the Tara. Um, so the number of red assets um, for SNC, which is assets that would need to be carried out or worked on before the MBR train sat running, was 20. So there's 20 SNC points to be carried out, work to be carried out before for the MBR train, and 16 SNC, 16 SNC points to be carried out, work to be carried out while the trains are running. And similarly for plain line, there's 12, 22 eighths of plain line that would need some work done, which is about two and a half miles of track, and amber. Amber, service, Amber, Amber plane line track was about six and a half miles of track that we need some work doing. So that, that's, this slide is just to give you an idea of sort of the numbers that have come out from the tower and how much work actually needs to be done across the route. Um, finally, we're going to look at some risks for me anyway. So based on the numbers I showed you previously, you can see that that deliverability will, will be a risk. So although we have the requirement to um, carry out red priority works before the MBR trains start running. Due to the volume of the work, it's not necessarily practicable. Um, you can hear something in the background, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> um, this is a big risk. So back back when we did this, this um, assessment, uh, the trains were slated to run in December 2019 and then 
imagine that amount of work needing to be done in basically a, a couple of months time that was a massive risk for us but as time has gone on now we have a bit more breathing room because the trains aren't supposed to be running at the same the same time but then so not not delivering that work in the time slated will affect Im impact on the asset plans. So where, where, where delivery cannot be completed before the MBR trains run, the um, RAMs would then need to prioritize those, as those um, work items in their work bank, which would then affect their own domestic plans and their funding. And then not create not doing this work as well introduces maintenance risks. So risks which include increased defects leading to block the line faults, um, temporary speed restrictions, more more of those, um, passenger and freight performance delays, um, more derailments possibly depend, depending on on the track. But also another maintenance risk that's been flagged up throughout this process is resourcing. So there's a there's a bit of a resource and capability issue to respond to a potential increase in defects and failures from, from the increased services. And so when the MBR trains start running also, there's the increase in track category in some areas, which will need, which will mean those those bits of track and SNC will need more, more inspection and that puts more pressure on the current resources. And as a result, um, the Northwest DUs have created uh, resource requirements, documents or reports to enable them to sufficiently deal with the increased pressure. And currently that's being reviewed by higher ups, I guess. In addition to that, with the um, proposed increase in traffic, there will potentially be less flexibility in the timetable, which will then be eaten into the main maintenance access, which, which is already quite limited at the moment. So more traffic means possibly eating into, into their maintenance, maintenance access times, which would then leave them less time to do potentially more work if there's more failures and more defects to attend to. So these are sort of the, some of the risks that we identify throughout the tower process. And the tower in itself is meant to sort of help mitigate against a few of these risks. And yeah, that's it for me. And I'll hand you back over to Dave. I can't hear you, Dave, if you're talking. Sorry, I put myself on mute there. So what uh <laughs> so what has happened since we did the tower review? Well the the the, the work banks that we generated uh, have been uh, accepted by uh, by the network uh, and by the, the asset management teams, and we've, we've been working together to try and sort of get those jobs in uh, as soon as we possibly can. The, the problem we had when we first encountered this was once we'd worked out from from August 19, we'd actually worked out what what sort of impact we were going to expect. Initially, we thought it was all going to happen uh, in December, which gave us very little time to actually be able to do anything. Uh, fortunately, the government did do a, uh, a freeze on HS2 while they did a financial assessment uh, of the project, uh, and that sort of pushed it all back a little bit. So we've had a bit of breathing space. And so since then, uh, we have started to, to, to see things being done. One thing that has happened is that HS2, uh, the materials barrel HS2 stuff has actually started running. So as you can see down the slide, uh, there's now two services a day running from Hindlow through to, to Washwood Heath. Uh, and quite a large tonnage of aggregate to be moved uh, by Christmas. Um, that's currently running, uh, coming out of Peak Forest area, Chinley, and then heading up towards Denton, uh, uh, across, uh, down to Stockport, down to Crewe, and then going on the BHIs, uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, and then round down, and then heading off south uh, towards Washwood Heath and Birmingham. So these things are starting to happen. Um, so some of the works have been undertaken to, to try and sort of uh, uh, mitigate these risks that we've, we've highlighted. So an example of one of them is uh, some work here to some S&C uh, on the Altrincham line uh, at Northern Junction, which was done by the uh, Manchester South TME. We've got an example of uh, some wet beds being removed at Tunstead, so this is Manchester East. Uh, and we've also got some, uh, some manual shovel packing uh, been undertaken on some S&C in Great Rocks again. This is Manchester East area. So this is all in the peak forest. So, so things are starting to happen. We're starting to get works done, uh, and hopefully uh, we're well on the way to start getting a, a, a more robust uh, bit of infrastructure to, to, to mitigate off these uh, these impacts. And that's just another shot of the the Great Great Rocks S&C work. So how does this just 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 bringing it back to asset management? So again, we're back to our asset management loop. Uh, how does this feed in? So 
uh, at the start of sort of uh, 2019, um, the, the asset management team will have, will have had their, their CP6 work bank already planned out. And, and very quickly after that, we start to look at uh, our CP7 work banks. So naturally, when we did the TARA process and risks, that would then feed straight back in uh, and has altered um, uh, some of those work banks, particularly in CP6. Uh, so we've, we've diverted some resources to deal with some of these risks. So what lessons have we learned from Tara? Well, the main thing is understanding what the, what the changes to the, to the network is, what, so what the operational changes are. So this is where attending to Craig or the, the TPRA, as it's, as it's now known, uh, is really vital. But like I said before, uh, it still doesn't quite capture freight as we want it to. So it's still a bit of a risk, but I think we're getting better at recognizing that risk um, um, as, a, as an industry. We're, we're, we're talking more, so there's more communication with operations, certainly in the time that I've dealt with it over the last sort of five years, I've seen a, a definite change, a positive change in how these things are communicated and a, and a, and a drive, a genuine drive to try and make it better. Um, one thing we do have, uh, we have another process. So some of you may be familiar with this old process that was uh, created by myself and a few others, uh, including sort of uh, Ian Ellis from, from Rock McDonald um, back in sort of 2003. So a Tarquin process, which uh, as it says there, track and light quality investigation. So why have I mentioned this? So, so as, as I see it, um, the Tara process is, is a fairly high level uh, indicator of where our risks are. So it helps us then focus our attention on particular areas uh, instead of sort of just panicking as a blanket, oh dear, what are we gonna do? We can start looking at these hotspots and have a better idea. Something like Tarquin, uh, which uh, which basically takes that review uh, another level down, so it takes into uh, all, all the various uh, asset data and information similar to Tarquin, but uh, sorry, similar to Tara. Um, but what the, the outputs from Tarquin are is it will give you uh, specific details on kind of rails, whether it's changing sleepers, ballast, formation, drainage, all that sort of stuff. So you can start to build up your work back in a bit better understanding of how your assets are going to react and what potentially you need to be doing. There's obviously other processes in place uh, to, to sort of capture that and, and, and um, boots on ballast is always still a good good, um, uh, good way to assess what's needed. But uh, I, I've taken to affectionately calling these two the siblings of specification. I don't think anyone else has. <laughs> um, but yeah, that just amuses me a little bit. Uh, so, so what have we done? What are the next steps? So basically, we're in, we've, we've uh, the Tara process, certainly in the Northwest, has been adopted and uh, uh, and certainly has been adopted by the maintenance organization. They think it was a great uh, tool to help uh, sort of capture what, what's going on and to facilitate those conversations into what needs to be done. Um, in terms of, uh, of routes, so uh, we've recently run Tara uh, on the Cumbria coast. So we've got the, the Energy Coast upgrade project that's going on in terms of the, uh, the West Coast, uh, uh, the West Cumbria mining and uh, eventually the, the power stations up there. So we've used Tara, we've had the discussions with maintenance and we're having discussions with the project and between us, we're, we're, we're developing a, a work bank, which, um, which will hopefully sort of make that whole network fairly robust and reliable. Uh, and the plan is then obviously is to roll that out uh, across the region because we, we seem to be getting really good results. So, so certainly things further south will start to get uh, this sort of process applied as well. Um, as a point of congratulate, congratulatory, uh, so I wrote a paper on this subject and submitted it as part of the, um, the Peter Rice Young Achiever Award uh, and she won a prize. So uh, congratulations to Ms. Oler again. Uh, it was an excellent piece of work. Uh, and just to sort of finish off, I'm going to do a shameless uh, plug of my own work. Um, so back end of this month, um, I'll be publishing a textbook on geotechs for rail engineers, which will cover track bed design, drainage, earthworks, slab track, all sorts of things. Uh, so hopefully that will be of use to people as well. Um, so that's it. That's our presentation. So thank you for listening. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, please feel free to ask questions verbally, guys. But if anyone doesn't want to speak up, then you can use the chat function and I can um, read out your questions, whichever you prefer. Stunned silence. Spent them all to sleep, I think.
Yeah. If anyone does want to ask a question, please remember you'll need to take yourself off. Please. That might be a first. Mm. <laughs> Apparently you did that good a job, you answered everyone's question. Uh, no, 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 one question has come in, sorry. Um, regarding what you said was the Tara system for S&C, how long would it take um, um it does take quite a long time so at the moment i'm in the process of trying to make the process a bit more automated but putting all that information from different sources that is quite cons time consuming yes it takes it takes a while <laughs> that's my answer <laughs> do you guys have any experience with things falling through the cracks i like dave um <laughs> Sorry, I'm just checking. Am I off mute? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think the main thing that we've experienced is is actually the other way around. Is is uh, is the conversations where the data really doesn't show anything. So, if, for example, in the Banbury area, um, uh, we had some some sections of track which were scoring really low, sort of in the single digits sort of area. But when you speak to the TME, uh, it was some of his worst. Uh, performing assets and some of his, his his biggest concerns. So it was interesting to see that from a data point of view, there was that quite a large disconnect. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's sort of fallen through the cracks yet, uh, where we've got it, where we've missed something and, and something's happened. But who knows? I'm sure that uh, you know these things happen, don't they? Um, we've, we've yet to see really once it once it fully takes off. So the material. So one thing I probably didn't say was that material barrel will will start to ramp up. So we've only got a couple of services, but it's it's due to start. So next year we'll probably see a significant increase uh, in those services coming in though for those 80 to, uh, 86 services. And we'll probably find out then, won't we, if we've missed anything. Um, another question for Basola on Tara. Um, your weightings use a linear scoring system. Do you think this approach could be limiting? Um I guess, but I think the way we've combated that is trying to get more sort of input from the maintainers and then using that to sort of factor into the work bank. So on its own, it's again, it, it can be quite limited. And like you said, there was some assets that were actually problematic on ground, but didn't score that well on the, or that high on the Tara. So having that maintenance input is, is really, is what, I guess it's what makes it more more realistic I guess and validates the process so it is but then having the maintenance bit helps combat that 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 challenge yeah I mean there's there's other things it's, it's a live it's a live process in a way so there yeah. are other things that can be factored in um so uh we're, we're always willing to to explore but I suppose in defense we, we had a very short time scale to come around come up with something that would help us uh it's, it's is really why we've ended up with what we have but it, let's say it's, we're constantly developing it and thinking of other things that will be brought in uh to, to to sort of help with that um i was going to say something in relation to the maintenance side of things and you know? uh, it's just escaped me i'll come back to that why are you thinking dave another another question on the snc ranking um as part of the decision support tool can it be implemented with the digital twin projects to try to streamline the development of remote asset monitoring? Oh, I'm not sure what the digital twin project is. <laughs> Never heard of that before. Um, <laughs> uh, but fortunately, I have. Uh, okay, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, anything that gives us uh, good usable data. Um, particularly anything that can produce uh, something that shows us a, a rate of remuneration. That's one thing we're not particularly brilliant at, uh, is, is a full understanding of how things deteriorate and at, and at what rate. Uh, and that generally because we've got so many factor, you know, sort of influences that can come in and, and change that. If it was in a solid, a steady state, then it's quite easy to predict. Uh, so if there's any processes out there that will, that will give us information, uh, then yes, absolutely, we can, we can factor that in. And ideally, we'd like to try and get this automated. Um, 
you know, so it's, so it's you can just basically type in ALR and it'll start coming up with that. So that's the ultimate goal that we're aiming for. Anything else? Any more questions, guys? They appear to have dried up. <laughs> Well, if there's no more questions, I'd like just like to take this opportunity to thank both Dave and Basola for for a really interesting, really interesting talk. It would be good to see what actually happens in reality once um once the traffic starts running. Hopefully, it won't have too severe an impact on the network. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do a uh, a, a, a review. Well, we'll have to do a review because obviously, uh, if things do start to fail, then we'll need to find out why why we've missed it, why where we've gone wrong. But hopefully. Uh, we will get to that situation. Uh, but if there is a if there is a uh, a reasonable amount of information to give a good update, say in, in sort of six twelve months, then uh, we'd be quite happy to come back and, and give an update. Yeah, it'd be really good to good to see whether your tools actually work in practice and whether you're able <laughs> yeah. to um whether well, but they're there on hand then, aren't they, to um to, for anything else like the Cumbrian coast or or Drax or whatever else comes yeah. to hit us. Freight's only going to increase, isn't it? Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the. I mean, it's a, it's a risk area we've always had within the industry. Is we've, we've never really managed uh, tonnages very well. Like yeah. say, from a maintenance point of view, uh, as you know, then it's always been twelve. Months <laughs> if you're lucky, uh, <laughs> I think yeah, at some yeah. point it was about three years out of date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're always playing catch up, aren't you? So if, if we can come up with a method that will help predict uh, and, and give us a fighting chance with our asset plans, then uh, so the better. Brilliant. Well, thank you both very much. Thank so, you. yeah, unless anyone else has got any other questions, um, I'll draw the meeting to a close and hopefully we'll um, see some of you, or be aware that some of you are online on the on the 3rd of December for, um, for welding updates. Thanks, ladies and gents. Thank you. Thank you.